Unger the Radar, bringing movies and people together, one frame at a time. Hey guys, I'm Randy Unger, and this is another episode of Unger the Radar, bringing movies and people together, one frame at a time. And with me today, uh, we have a, a veteran uh, critic to the show and a good friend, Ivy Lofberg. Welcome back, Ivy. Thank you. It's so great to be back. It's been a while. It's been a few months, but um, you know, I, the last time we reviewed, it was a it was a Nicolas Cage double feature, which I was really happy about. Uh, we did Renfield and Vampire's Kiss. Uh, I thought it was a very appropriate combination, and uh, you know, I thought we had a great time reviewing those two movies. And I just want to welcome you back. So, uh, how how's everything been since Renfield, Ivy? Super. <laughs> Yeah, it's funny because I feel like we're kind of starting to enter Renfield season now with October right around the corner. So good, good time to be back. <laughs> <laughs> that is very true. We're going to get a lot of fun uh, Halloween themed uh, reviews. So I am excited about that, too. Um, but uh, for today, uh, we're going to be we're not going to really be discussing scary films, but we are going to be discussing violent films. <laughs> And um, for those watching at home, uh, if you're a little squeamish, we will be discussing some violent, uh, you know, plot points in certain movies. But um, we'll, we'll try to keep that at a minimum. Uh, the first film that is now out on Amazon Prime Video, it's called The Baker, and it stars Ron Perlman as an aging uh, baker who has a particular set of skills and uses these skills to protect his granddaughter uh, after her, uh, his son uh, basically gets involved in some, some shady dealings. And now it's up to Ron Perlman's character, the baker, to become the butcher. Uh, I thought this film was okay. You know, it did not impress me uh, in the least, but it was, um, you know, it was very well acted by the three main leads, uh, especially the young girl, who was, her name is Emma Hope. And young girl, she's basically uh, mute throughout the whole film. And she actually serves as a good foil to uh, Ron Perlman's Baker. And, uh, you know, we've seen this type of film a, a lot over the decades. You know, this aging guy who kind of gets, he springs back into action to basically uh, serve his own kind of vigilante justice. But uh, yeah, average film, didn't think it was great, but it was still watchable. Ivy, thoughts on The Baker? Yeah, I, I really agree with you, Randy. I felt like it was uh, pretty, it was like decent, you know, it, it was watchable. It, it was kind of, a, kind of a way to pass the time. It didn't like rock my world in any way, but I, I also do really think that those are like really reliable, good plots you know it, where it always keeps the story interesting of someone who like the 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 baker character who, who wants to be done you know with with his old life and is trying so hard um but he's really a, like a hero at heart and he has to save his grandchildren his grandchild so he has to you know come back um and use his skill set you know for like justice and and i i feel like that is always kind of, um, I, I think that's not that hard to mess up, you know, cause they, I've like in, in its storyline, it's really interesting, you know, but, and compelling, but I, I agree with you. It was, it was like a pretty predictable version of that. Like I kind of just knew right away, you know, when the son dropped the daughter off, what was gonna happen and how it was all gonna go. And it's like, right. oh, you know, this will be, um you know a, a decent ride yeah like we get a movie like this like it seems like every few months you know and usually in this type of movie we would get maybe Liam Neeson uh you know Nicolas Cage has also been guilty of uh, taking roles like this so it was good to see Ron Perlman because you know Ron Perlman obviously a very seasoned character actor probably you know best known as Hellboy the first Hellboy and among other like tough guy roles, uh, one of which one film we're going to be discussing in a few minutes uh, for our retro review. But yeah, this is just, you know, it's just a cookie cutter action thriller, 
not really offering much new, you know, much that's that's new. Um, the fight choreo choreography was okay. You know, it just, I don't know. I, I wanted more, you know, but, you know, going into it, you you, you get what you, you pay for, basically, with a movie like The Baker. So totally. it, it was yeah. interesting to see Harvey Keitel in there. Right. Too, right. You know, just, yeah, he, he was, yeah, he was good. It felt kind of like everyone was like doing their jobs and, you <laughs> right. know. Uh, I, I also agree it was fun to see Ron, Ron Perlman in that kind of role was was interesting um I always remember him too from Beauty and the Beast um, <laughs> TV. um and he's always a really interesting actor I feel like and I, I think that that's what made it more watchable is I think that um, if it was a less interesting actor I think it would have just been too boring but I think you know yeah. just he has a really unique appearance and he, he uses it really well, I feel like. And, mm -hmm. and he, I think he, he was bringing a lot, a lot to the role too. Yeah. Yeah. He definitely, he wasn't phoning it in. Um, unlike some of the other actors, one of the actors that did kind of seem to that like he was there, but not really there. Uh, Elias Kotias, um, who was basically one of the, uh, the the shady uh criminals in this film uh elias Cotius, obviously uh everybody knows him as casey jones from the first ninja turtles movie back in 1990 uh among many other performances uh, i wanted more from him I, I felt like he was kind of you know he was kind of stepping back a bit he wasn't really giving his all in the performance but uh and i i i, I hate to say this about harvey keitel but well, he wasn't he wasn't phoning it in, but he just wasn't utilized as much as I would have wanted. Because you know, I love I love Keitel. I've loved him since Taxi Drivers and since Mean Streets. He's a fantastic actor, and he was part of the reason why I wanted to, I picked this film, just because of his star power. So he was only in the film, I want to say like five minutes tops, right? And um, wanted a, much more from him. Same with uh, from Joel David Moore, who plays um, the Baker's son, and I I know him best uh, from Grandma's Boy, which was a really fun stoner comedy in two thousand six. Uh, he was also in Avatar. I think it was in the sequel too, but uh, he, he's a very uh, good actor too. So I, I wanted more of him as well. But uh, it was I really yeah. Sorry. I sorry to interrupt, but I I agree with you. I I think that that was uh, something that that did hurt the movie is because he was right there at the beginning. You know, he really was the the force of of getting into the the movie. And I I also felt too like, you know, he he wasn't really like I didn't feel like I really was that concerned about what right. was. Going on in his life yeah. he was just so um with his dad he was just like so nonchalant like he, he just didn't feel like he was like plugged into like the real stakes of anything right. that was happen like what kind of what did he expect was gonna happen with <laughs> with stealing money like that from such violent criminals like <laughs> He, he he just um he f it felt like he was honing it in yeah you know so th these are some really good uh characters it's just that the, they weren't they tied into each other they weren't like i don't know the, the connectors between each individual character was off uh maybe it, it was the script that was lacking um maybe you know if, if the script were tighter and uh, the characters would have been more you know connected like especially like a, a father son uh, relationship, which is really important to any form of uh, you know dramatic art. You know, I I think that 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 father son connection was severely lacking, and it was part of this film's um, one of its negatives. I'd say. I I think so too because it for the thing that was the main plot point of the whole movie, you know, is that. And I understand too that they had to kind of play it that they didn't have a relationship and he just wanted to not have a relationship and kind of felt like it's like I think Ron Perlman played it well that 
you know, that he was concerned. It feels like that his PTSD and kind of his real like brutal skill set is not great to have around children. <laughs> so I, I feel like that would have been more interesting too. I feel like to play off of like that he was protecting hmm. um, his, his kid in a way by isolating himself from them, you know, because of what he was capable of. And this kind of felt like his son had just, um, yeah, it, it didn't feel like he was his son. It felt like even right. in movies I've seen where those relationships are strained or they don't have any relationship. Like this really felt like he was dropping him off at like a, a, a friend of a friend. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's disappointing, but you know, again, I, as I said, you get, get what you pay for movie like this. It is, you know, it, we get to get this type of movie at least once a month. And yeah, it is nice to see Ron Perlman shine in an action role like this. Uh, cause you know, like you said, he's got a very unique look and he keeps things interesting. So I am, I'm fairly happy with this movie. I probably won't see it again ever but we'll see maybe but um i i am definitely um re I'm, I'm invested in ron perlman's filmography now uh speaking of which uh he he was in a film uh that was in 2011 where he he had a relatively small part he played like this uh like a criminal uh henchman mafia henchman uh the film is called drive and it is one of my all-time favorite crime thrillers slash action films and in case you guys watching and listening are not familiar uh drive stars ryan gosling as an unnamed driver he's basically a a, a hollywood stuntman stunt driver who basically moonlights as a getaway driver for uh criminals and he gets involved it's a it's a very sordid mess he gets involved with this woman played by carrie mulligan she has a son uh, her husband has just been released from prison and basically uh, Gosling's character and Oscar Isaac's character team up to uh, basically rob a pawn shop. It all goes horribly wrong and the mafiosos behind it, played by a wonderful, wonderful Albert Brooks, my, one of my favorite actors in a rare villainous role, uh, his uh, number two man is uh, Nino, a, a very like a brute. He's like a really he's played by Ron Perlman and he is just he's pretty scary in this movie. But uh, Drive 2011. This is a retro review of that. Love this movie. And yeah, it's one of the first times I actually really noticed Ron Perlman, who gives it his all in this performance as Nino. And this film just does not disappoint. I rewatched it just a couple nights ago and it holds up it, it does it only gets better actually <laughs> but uh ivy drive what are your impressions <laughs> yeah also couldn't agree with you more randy it's also one of my favorite uh crime action or thriller what <laughs> that whole category <laughs> exists in everything I, everything. <laughs> I think it's um one of the best movies of 2011 mm -hmm. It really, I feel like it belongs in like those, the lists of like greatest films. It, I, th I think it's a masterpiece. And I, what I love most about it too is, um, is it feels, I love movies where it's like they, it feels like LA. Like it feels like this is happening in LA. I feel like Ryan Gosling, that character has probably been my Uber driver. Like, I feel like, <laughs> I you hope know, not. <laughs> but it feels like it, it it really captures like what's so bizarre about LA, I feel like if the the undercurrent of of like this of all the the really wild um meeting points I feel like that LA has. I feel like the film really it's like one of those movies that could I feel like could only take place in a, in LA because it so captures so much of that you like uh, someone who's like a stunt driver um by day and moonlights is like a, a a driver at night for for criminals who also is 
you know, wanting to make the jump into being a race car driver, hopefully, <laughs> um, like all, all these different meeting points, I like, um, and kind of just this character where you, you just don't know where he came from. You don't know yeah. anything about him throughout the whole movie. You never learn anything about him, but it know. doesn't matter. It's got like um like a like a Clint Eastwood Sergio Leone uh, type of uh, vibe to it. The, the man with no name, you know, who just kind of randomly swoops in and 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 delivers justice, and just really, even though he's a criminal, he's a getaway driver, he's still like he, his heart is in the right place, you know. And what he is doing is more morally ambiguous throughout the whole movie. But I think um he's a fantastic character. Uh, you know, like it is a love letter to L.A. I mean, I haven't spent much time in L.A., but it does feel like that would be what it would a, a very good depiction of that of that city. Also, I want to talk about the um, the style of the film and the soundtrack. It's like it's very, very hip, very 80s, kind of funky and like it, it kind of timeless in a way. Um I just also want to give um, a shout out to uh, the director, Nicholas Winding, Nicholas Winding Refn. Uh, if I'm butchering that, Mr. Refn, I apologize. But yeah, uh, he has done a fantastic job with this movie. Just everything from the lighting to the editing to the sound design. Uh, the sound actually, the, the sound editing was actually nominated at the Academy Awards that year. Uh, I believe that was the only nomination. But this, I'm surprised this film wasn't even nominated for Best Picture because this had a good shot really it um it it debuted at the two the 2011 uh Cannes film festival there was a standing ovation for that and it also uh won best director for mr reffin and yeah this movie it just like i said um i haven't i haven't it's been a few years since i've seen it but i rewatched it just a few nights ago and whew, just great it got better with time um I, but yeah uh ron perlman He's in it. He's, uh, you know, he serves his purpose in the film. You know, he has a doesn't have a lot of screen time, but when he does, he he pretty much lights up the screen. So yeah, I'm really happy um, with his performance and everybody else in the cast. Um, mentioned Gosling, uh, Carrie Mulligan. Didn't mention Brian Cranston yet, who's also fantastic in this. Uh, he basically plays Ryan Gosling's uh, boss at the local garage, who is involved with albert brooks character um christina hendrix has a very small part uh during the robbery uh uh and oscar isaac is this is actually one of the first uh, performances i've seen of his and i love him uh i love the whole cast really and they have all gone on to do great things uh, ivy what did you think of the, of the cast uh, overall yeah, I I completely agree. I feel like everybody in this cast was new. I felt like they knew they were a part of something great and they just all gave it mm -hmm. their best. I, I, I feel like it really reflects him as a director because he got uh, these performances like out of Albert Brooks that was so <laughs> terrifying. Oh my gosh. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, that like the scenes where he's just um he is like one of the scariest people like you never want to <laughs> never want to meet yeah. um and you you're so right he's known for being incredibly funny and he uses all of that in such a terrifying way in this role and and um I agree Christine Hendricks was wonderful and such a surprise um, to see her play a, a character like that. And uh, Carrie was wonderful. I, I always really like her work a lot. She, I feel like she does such a great job of like, she really can um, appear like, you know, like a sing, like a mom, you know, living in LA, raising a kid with kind of a criminal husband. Like she just really, disappeared into that role in in the best way and and she was such a sympathetic character you know i i really i absolutely love to um he that they made her like so like uh sympathetic and also just how naive she was you know that she thought um her husband who just got out of prison was beaten up by 
some drunk teenagers like she believed that story you know and in that moment you know Ryan's character was like oh <laughs> I really have to protect this like baby bird like she really <laughs> doesn't know what's going on in the world um and and I thought that was really really cool you know that um that she kind of played it um is just this really sympathetic sweet woman you know who um needed some real protection and and but not in a way that she didn't seem helpless she just seemed like a bit in over her head <laughs> yeah she was yeah she was definitely in the middle of the situation and you know we it was kind of terrifying like is albert brooks gonna come after her like is this you know is are, is benicio next is the you know like she, she's so innocent and she's she's just trying to make sense of it all like getting involved with with standard played by oscar isaac and then getting involved with with the driver you know she, she just has bad luck with men it seems <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and i think <laughs> that's what i loved so much about it too is that you know i i did live in la for quite a few years and and it does it, it's because it, the city is just so spread out and people you know, really come there um, to become a lot of people to become successful, at, you know, in the, the film industry, or at least to make money from mm -hmm. it. So it, I, I feel like, like, it is so that's why I love the movie so much. Like, it's so easy to imagine living next to <laughs> a character like Ryan Gosling, um, where you don't know where he came from, you don't know anything about him. But somehow, you know, he has the charisma that you don't even care. You know, like, like they really, that city really attracts characters like that. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, again, I have never lived in LA. I've, I've visited, I love it. Um, I have not really, you know, explored the nightlife, but uh, I am intrigued now revisiting this film. Um, compared to New York, New York versus LA on film, which do you prefer, Ivy? <laughs> oh what a great question I think LA actually okay. yeah I think LA because it is like I love Mulholland Drive because I feel like what's really interesting about New York is I feel and I love movies of New York too so much and New York is pretty much everything is um not everything but a lot of things are on the surface you know mm -hmm. like oh. you can see you know the stuff that's happening is kind of happening in in front of of a lot of people generally, you know, mm -hmm. where I feel like um, LA really is is very mysterious. Like it has a, a mysterious kind of feeling to it where it, it feels like really translates really well on film is kind of this like spooky kind of otherworldly feeling that it, that you like, I feel like I, I uh, saw Mulholland Drive and then I, I in Drive, and then I lived in LA, and then I understood the movies. <laughs> okay, that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now I, I have to to spend about a year in LA to um to realize <laughs> realize your your point there. So maybe in the future we'll see. I've always I've always had a soft spot for for California. I, you know, I've been I was born and raised in Queens, and I feel like the West Coast is calling. <laughs> But um, that is another episode, I think, or something else. Awesome. Uh, so yeah, oh God, Drive. I, I can't talk, uh, I can't say enough good things about this film, you know? And, you know, I I, I have to mention Albert Brooks again, uh, because he's one of my favorite actors. Uh, Ivy, are, are you a fan of the man's uh, work, of his comedic stuff? And he's done some dramatic stuff too. Are you, do you, do you like Brooks? I love I love uh, defending your life. It's one yes. of my favorite movies. Um, I'm forgetting Lost in America is that was very good. That was uh, yeah. Good. It, he really brings that. He brings a, a special quality that um, it, it feels like I've never. Um, I'm, he's one of my favorite. Like I've never seen him really in anything where I felt like it was disappointing. Like he he yeah. just brings such an incredible quality to whatever he does. And um, I, I felt like it was a really great idea to yeah. like, it, it would be interesting to read up a little bit on what made the director decide um, to approach Albert Brooks to play right. this really dramatic, scary 
role and um and really kind of use all of his like deadpan ness and, and no. uh, to be this really scary a scary guy you know and who really could do horrendous things without you even yeah. really realizing you've done them well, let me read this real quick on on wikipedia here um Albert Brooks plays the foul-mouthed, morose Bernie Rose. When Ruffin suggested him, Gosling agreed, but thought the actor might not want to play a character who is violent and sullen or appear in a film that he did not work on himself. Brooks accepted the role to go against type, and because he loved that, Bernie was not a cliche. And, uh, yeah, I guess he just wanted to to, to branch out. Uh, maybe it was a challenge for him. He wanted to... He welcomed that challenge because um, for, like... 45 years uh brooks has been you know a comedian a funny man and a lot of like ro romantic comedies so brilliant brilliant choice on his part on the director's part for casting him it's weird they, they i think they did something to his hair his makeup to kind of make him look sinister and yeah. it, it 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 really worked because it's crazy this is the same guy who voiced uh marlin in finding nemo <laughs> it's like what is going on here but uh it works it works exceptionally well and um there is a scene i'm not going to get into gory detail but there is a a straight edge razor which that scene sticks with me to this day and it's just horrific so those who have not seen drive yet be prepared. It is a very violent film. It's it's crazy. It's, it's but it's it's awesome. It's one. It's definitely definitely one of the best films of 2011, and quite possibly of the 21st century. So I just wanted to say that. Um, but yeah, the Baker currently uh, available to rent or buy on Amazon Prime Video. So check that out if you feel so inclined. If you want something other than a Liam Neeson action movie. There you go. <laughs> uh, and also Drive, um, I believe, is also streaming. Uh, I'm not sure where, but it's it's pretty easy to find. Uh, just buy it on Blu-ray. It's, it's that good. So um, we have a couple minutes left, Ivy. And I just wanted to see, um, are there any, any plugs, any projects you're working on now? Uh, yeah, I'm doing a fun project um, on my Instagram. Uh, my Instagram is just my name, at Ivy Lockberg. And I'm doing something called Film Remedy, where um, I just pick a monthly theme, and then I just um, have share films that are um, about that theme. And so this month, the theme <laughs> fresh starts. So it's all films um, and just little descriptions of why that film is a good fit for the theme. It's like little mini reviews um, just to kind of share. There's just so many great films out there i feel like you know especially with scream with screaming with streaming um there's just so many incredible films out there that i i feel like just get lost really quickly and and they just get lost in the feed um and so i kind of i'm doing this too just from decades of of watching movies and just wanting to share with people um uh, I really I do a movie a day and I have a, a movie a day for years and years so <laughs> so um, check it out so a movie a day on your Instagram like a, yeah. um, okay I'm checking it out now I'll check it out later but um <laughs> very exciting stuff congratulations Ivy awesome <laughs> uh, and as for me um I just want to do a quick plug for this uh this new musical it's actually a really fun musical called Junk and it stars Tim Moss and Robbie Wayne. Um, it's basically about uh, two individuals who are cleaning out uh, a relative's um, house in the like in a rural part of America. And uh, yeah, it's actually got some good songs in it. It's, it's catchy. It's uh, it's pretty funny too. And it stars Tim Moss and Robbie Wayne. So uh, I will have more information regarding that uh, project uh, soon. I hope. But uh, also, if you want to see new episodes of Unger the Radar, just tune in um, to uh, Manhattan Neighborhood Network, Mondays at 11 a.m. Eastern, uh, 8 a.m. Pacific, and as always on Sirius XM through Slam Radio SXM uh, every Thursday night at 8 o'clock Eastern, 8 p.m. Eastern, 
uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. So tune in for those episodes. Uh, Ivy, I want to thank you so much for your time. You're awesome. <laughs> and Thanks, Benny. So great to be here. Yeah, you're always welcome. You know that. <laughs> awesome, awesome. So guys, I'm Randy Younger. This has been Under the Radar, bringing movies and people together one frame at a time. We'll see you next time. Take care, guys. Under the Radar is brought to you by Magnitude Jewelry. Add a two to match your attitude. Patent pending interchange genuine gemstone and crystal EMF protection jewelry. For more information, please visit magnitudejewelry.com slash gemgirl or call 718-268-6634. Hey guys, I'm Randy Younger, and this is another edition of Unger the Radar, where we talk all things film. And with me today, I have actor, producer, uh, Chris Showerman, who's featured in the, in the drama Complacent. It's a great film. It's about married life and the tragedy that can happen in certain marriages. And with me today, Chris, welcome so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here today. Oh, thank you so much, Randy. I really appreciate being on the show. Yeah, this is very cool. Um, I want to thank you for your time. And I'm just curious, how did you get involved with the film? With Complacent, um, I met uh, Stephen Monroe, the director of Complacent, through a close buddy of mine, and I believe you know him too, Clint Morris. Mm -hmm. um, so Clint uh, was, is a PR agent and uh, connected me up with Stephen and, and we hit it off and I've actually done a couple of projects with Steven since then. He's a great director. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, and it's obviously a very uh, heavy film. It's very intense at times. Um, what was it like getting into the, into the character? Because your, your character is sort of on the sidelines a bit. He's kind of observing. But um, yeah. what was it like uh, observing all the madness? <laughs> you know, well, it was fun. Um, Jason was the name of my character. And Jason... He's one of those guys that's, and you see this in life all the time, somebody who's sort of easily brought into whatever's around them. You know, it doesn't, at the beginning, I, and I, I don't judge him for this, but he, he just sort of picked the choices of the choices that people picked around him. So he didn't really have his own direction. And, and I felt like Jason's journey through complacent was finding his own backbone and, and finding a purpose to be his own man. And uh, the, the coming of his own child uh, was sort of the beginning of that. And we just see him starting to turn a corner uh, by the end. So. Yeah, and I would have liked to have seen more of him, to be perfectly honest with you. Oh, um, thank you. Yeah, and it's such a great cast. Um, what was it like on set? Was there a lot of uh, camaraderie? There was, yeah. It's, um, you know, we shot this uh, several years ago now and um everybody got along really well and and i think a big part of that was steven too because steven sort of brings this this very jovial atmosphere even to this this heavy film so he found ways to to lighten it up um working with michael worth was definitely a high point michael was a uh, uh, great professional and and really knew his craft um, we got to work with Carrie Green, which was fantastic. Serena Vincent, of course, uh, pretty much the star of Complacent. And Joey Kern. So great cast, great, uh, great people to work with in front of and behind the camera. Nice. Um, that's great to hear. I love I, do, I just love hearing uh, stories of collaboration and how, you know, uh, everyone on set kind of gels together. So that's really yeah. nice. <laughs> well, 
you know, and, and it's funny, Randy, because that's, that's sort of the magic of, well, the blessing and the curse of this industry, because it's so necessarily collaborative. And uh, that's one of the reasons why right now in the middle of, of a pandemic, it's really been, entertainment has really been hit really hard because it is so collaborative. It's very hard to make something in a vacuum, mm -hmm. um, make something very, but you can do a one man show, you can, you can write, you can do a lot of stuff on your own, but when it actually comes to producing, you know, a full fleshed out story, you know, mm -hmm. people, and you need people in proximity. So um, yeah. it's looking back on all those experiences, it's even more magical now because we miss it so much. We miss yeah. connecting with people like that. You don't fully appreciate it until it's not there anymore. But um, you, seem to, the you seem to be making do. Like you seem to be really yeah. um, doing well. And um, I know that you've been involved with uh, uh, Path of Leash Resistance. Um, <laughs> tell everyone about that and, and what it's like working uh, during the pandemic. Oh, thank you for asking. This is, this is a project that's very near and dear to my heart. It has nothing to do with the entertainment industry other than hopefully it's kind of entertaining when it's going out. Um, so the path of leashed resistance uh, comes from uh, a problem that popped up during the pandemic when some friends of mine wanted to work out. I work out a lot. And so they turned to me and said, well, what do I do? And I suggested buying some weights. And then we started shopping online for dumbbells and barbells. And I'm, the price of, of fitness equipment that was available was just skyrocketing. I saw a pair of dumbbells for $2,500 and I thought, this is ridiculous. I don't want to see my friends get price gouged. Let's find a new way to give them an, a, a fitness routine. Okay. And so through a lot of trial and error, which I won't bore you with, I ended up uh, with a couple of dog leashes. Right. Really simple. You can buy them at the dollar store for a buck a piece. <laughs> and uh, if they're heavy duty and they're nylon, with with good stitching you can rely on them to do a full body workout and what i discovered working with my friends and working with these leashes that there are ways to work literally every single part of your body hmm. with just a pair of leashes and besides that it's super fun to do <laughs> all right and that's how we came up with the name path of leashed resistance too because it's dog leashes so so does every exercise involve the leashes most every exercise does. Um, and so we were releasing new exercises every Friday on YouTube uh, and through various social media platforms, but they all point back to YouTube. And the, there, are, there are a few that we haven't released yet that don't require anything, um, but a lot of the exercises that are purely just body weight exercises are exercises you can get anywhere. And I wanna give you, stuff that is is specific and and unique to the program so most of them yes do do use the leashes and it's very simple it's very fun it's stuff that you can do with a friend stuff that gets you out of the house breathing some fresh air and soaking in some sunshine which i also love That's so awesome. it's uh yeah it's really fun do you now do you work out do you have a fitness routine i'll be honest with you i have my i haven't really engaged in anything since before the pandemic um i was a big zumba guy like pilates mm -hmm. as well um but i i kind of stopped lifting weights uh after i left college i don't know i kind of yeah. just kind of you know gravitated more towards cardio stuff and yeah but uh, that's why I'm, I'm kind of excited to speak with you today because i, I am actually I, I definitely need to get back into shape so i needed some tips <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. <laughs> Bring it on. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in college, I was going every night, five nights a week, you know, and I was cut. I mean, wow. I, I had abs and, you know, I haven't had abs in maybe oh, 10 years. So yeah, <laughs> it's, um, it's embarrassing. And uh, everyone listening, I'm sorry, but uh, I am looking to, to eventually get back into that. So Chris, what, what well, would be a good, uh, like an, a good introduction, like back into uh, working out? <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's easy. It's fun. I think it's pretty accessible. And if anyone has questions on it, they can always write to me. Um, there's a website uh, as well called uh, www.pathofleashedresistance.com, which tries to spell out each exercise step by step. And, and I encourage people to reach out to me through social media or uh, Instagram if 
if they have any questions, but I don't think there will be because I think it's pretty straightforward. Um, and uh, so, yeah, they, but the videos themselves, some of the things that make them path of least resistance videos, you know, some of the things that they kind of brand that mm. are, they're all 60 seconds long. They're no longer than 60 seconds. They play like a monster truck commercial. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's really a commercial for the exercise. It's not intended for you to watch while you're doing the exercise. You watch it, you get the idea, and then you go outside and you just do it with your friends. Um, yeah, and so they're quick, they're fun. Uh, in some cases, they're funny, and yet they're intended to be informative and to inspire you to go out there and just get it done. Now, is, is this a new career path for you, a uh, personal trainer slash instructor? <laughs> well, you know, I've, I've been a, a trainer since long before the earliest uh, successes of my career. Okay. So I, I was a trainer back in the mid nineties mm -hmm. and, uh, and I love fitness. My, as I am often quoted saying, I, my favorite client is myself. <laughs> so I'm always, <laughs> always training me if I'm not training anybody else. Uh, but no, the path of least resistance is not really intended to be a money grab. It's free, and I'm just putting it out there uh, literally because I, I felt like there was a need, and I wanted to share this with other people. I figured if my friends were in a situation where they felt trapped and couldn't work out, somebody else must feel that way as well. And I wanted to share this information for free. And like I said, if you have a couple of dog leashes at home or can drop a couple of bucks at the dollar store and buy a couple of heavy duty nylon dog leashes, you're, you're good to go. And that's the only expense in it. And you've been involved in, in, in work. You've been involved in exercise since a, a long time. Obviously, George the, George the Jungle 2, you're yeah. very cut. So uh, yeah. that's very good. And that was almost yeah 17 years ago and you, you're still at it so i i commend you on keeping up with that <laughs> thanks man thank yeah. you well I, I i'd like to take a lot of credit for that but honestly it's it's just as much um a mental you know psychological uh regime for me as it is a physical one because mm -hmm. i find that if i don't get to move every day get outside and, and uh do something to yeah. exercise my demons then I go a little nutty so I, I really I really embrace uh, fitness for my mental health as well that's yeah I mean lifting a weight is nothing compared to the actual built mustering up the courage to actually go to the gym or go outside for a jog so that's Amen. you know that's so true <laughs> yeah there's there's like this this quantum leap from the couch <laughs> to, to moving towards where, and that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest rep you'll do is stepping up off the couch. For sure. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about uh, Shora's film. What a, that's your product, production company? Yeah. Yeah, so Shora's film is a company that I put together with uh, my aforementioned buddy, Clint Morris. Uh, Clint and I, uh, have we have different skill sets and so it's, we're perfect together because we can sort of cover the whole the whole gambit of things and we're we're working on different continents so it makes it uh, an international company <laughs> nice. but short film has uh, produced just a, a few things uh our first project was uh, short to get a, a western sold called between the sand and the sky okay. and um uh, the one that's out that you can access right now is a music drama called Radio America. Okay. Um, so that was, yeah, that was our, our, our big thing that we put out cool. semi-recently. And then, yeah, yeah, hopefully more to come. That's awesome. And is it, is it just film or is it film and TV? Or are you venturing into maybe music videos or is, is it just film at this time? Uh -huh. <laughs> These are all great ideas. Right now, it's just film. That's all that we've. <laughs> but right. I don't know. Maybe we'll rope you into Shores Film, and then you can you can start generating some new ideas for us, like music. Do videos. it. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Um, now you've done film and TV. Uh, yeah. Do you prefer one over the other? I I love them both, and they're they're similar in a lot of ways, and then in in some unique ways, they're very very different. Like TV is so quick moving and it's it's amazing uh, like when i was working on supergirl a lot of times my call time for supergirl would be let's say six six or six thirty in the morning 
and they would hit the ground running and I'd be on my way home at 8 a.m. And that's how, how quick they sometimes work. Now, not every day is that way, but the, it, is, it is a fast moving medium because they have to crank out a full episode in, in seven or eight days. And yeah. you know, I, most people realize at this point that that's, that's quite a feat. That's really hard to do. Whereas film, it's a little more luxurious. You have, yeah. uh, you're still busy and you're still working all the time, but you have uh, less of a, of a deadline breathing down your neck because you, you know, uh, hopefully if, if you have a set a release date, um, it can be moved if it has to be. So mm -hmm. people take more time, I think, with film. So they're both very different animals. And yeah, they're, they're slightly different animals. It's still, there's still a camera and actors and directors and stuff. <laughs> but but gotta, yeah, it's a, just got to feel the best to it a little bit. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. It's awesome. Yeah. Um, but back to the pandemic, I mean, you know, we can't, yeah. we can't avoid what's going on around us. Uh, what has it been like for you uh, creatively working uh, during the age of COVID? You know, well, um, production kind of ground to a halt here at the beginning of the year and it's starting to trickle back now which is yeah. fantastic um and i've had a little bit of work since it started to come back but i think i speak for the whole entertainment community to say we were all unemployed for a long time there mm -hmm. and it was a fantastic thing for me creatively i got to write a book um i got to come up with path of leashed resistance uh, i got to do a lot of things all those someday projects that Someday never comes. Well, someday finally came in our lifetime, and and so I got to I got to do all of those someday projects that uh, never got around to before. So it's been great. And I'll tell you, for me, it's been it's actually been kind of a blessing in disguise because you know I wouldn't be able to talk to people like you. Uh, I didn't even know what Zoom was uh, half a year ago. Right. I know. <laughs> I'd never heard of it. Yeah. Here we are. Yeah. That's great. Well, and yeah, I, Randy, you talked to a bunch of amazing people i was looking at your stuff and and blown away by some of the people that that you reach out to i loved your your tobo interview um last month oh he's <laughs> one of my favorites steven tablowski that yeah. was an absolute thrill uh, i was very lucky to get him he was so yeah. down to earth such a such a great guy such a nice person and um i was lucky to get that one so that was a good one <laughs> yeah yeah you were and he is he's a, a lovely person i've met him and um, yeah, someday I hope to work with him, but okay. what a creative and, and truly genuine guy. Yeah, definitely. Um, and speaking of, you know, stars and, uh, again, collaboration, yeah. uh, yeah. who are, who are some of your, like, if you look back on your career, who are some of your highlights, like actors, filmmakers that you've worked with that you'd love to work with again? Um, well, definitely right at the top of the list, uh, for me was the producer, Jordan Kerner. Uh, Jordan was transcended producer for me and it was when I did George of the Jungle it was one of the first projects not even first big pro projects but one of the first projects that I had done I'd done a lot of independent stuff but I'd never done any any uh, studio projects up to that point and Jordan transcended being a producer and really became kind of a father figure to me he really took me under his wing and I think that's I'm not unique in that way that's how Jordan is he um he really uh, takes a personal vested interest in the entirety of the project, which is a very big thing to consider. Um, so love to work with Jordan again. That was, that was a real treat. Um, as far as actors go, uh, I've gotten to do a few projects with C. Thomas Howell, and he is, he is a hoot to work with. I don't think I've ever laughed uh, more in my life than, than our first project that we did together. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> um there's uh, a lot more of course um everybody on george of the jungle julie benz is a delight uh christina pickles uh thomas hayden church uh, mm -hmm. how lucky was i to get to work with them they're you know all good people on top of great artists so so i i count myself doubly lucky to have spent time with all of them and speaking of uh george of the jungle did um did brendan Fraser ever reach out to you was is there any like contact there i'm curious <laughs> Yeah, that's a great question. And, and there's a great story that goes with that. So I had, you know, they were, they really wanted Brendan to come back to do the second one. And he was tied up doing uh, Looney Tunes back in action at the time. And I believe he was having a, uh, his second child uh, coming into the world. So 
So there was a lot going on in Brendan's life at the time, and he just couldn't take on George of the Jungle, so, which was very, very lucky for me. So <laughs> I got to do it. Um, and once we were finished filming George, we shot it in Australia. When we came back to the States, a buddy of mine who was on the VFX crew said, hey, Chris, we're going we're gonna to shoot some effects plates in, in Las Vegas. We don't need you. You don't need to be there. But would, if you want to come and hang out, Vegas is Vegas. It's super fun. Um, you're welcome to come. Nice. So I went and because I got to stay with him. He was staying at the Four Seasons and, and we got to go up into the Luxor and, you know, right up into the pinnacle of that building and uh, some other really exclusive experiences that we got to do in Vegas. But while I was in Vegas, uh, staying at the Four Seasons, found out that Brendan was also staying at the Four Seasons <laughs> while he was working on Looney Tunes. And I thought, well, this is a super long shot, but, and, and I felt stupid doing it because I'm not somebody that writes fan mail, but I wrote him a letter. I told him how much I loved his portrayal of George. I hope that, I hope I didn't embarrass him too much with, with me taking up the mantle and, and um, you know, wish him luck and tell him I was a big fan, which is all true. <laughs> and left it with the concierge. And I said, look, I know Mr. Frazier is staying here. If you can get this to him, great. If you can't, throw it away, no big deal. Um, and that's it. And I never thought about it again uh, until about six months later, I was doing a charity event uh, and it was a, it was a dodgeball event. They were raising money and we were playing celebrities we were playing dodgeball and Brendan Fraser was going to be there. I was like, Oh great. I'll finally, hopefully get to meet him. And as I'm sitting there waiting, this guy comes up from my peripheral vision and gets right down on my level. And he says, Hey, Chris, my name's Brendan. It's great to meet you. I'm like, I know who you are. How do you know who I am? He said, dude, I got your letter in Vegas, but you didn't put your phone number on it. Otherwise, we would have got together. <laughs> so, so the warmest guy, uh, he could not have been more gracious and more supportive of me uh, taking on his role uh, to continue George of the Jungle. And I got to meet him, ran into him a couple of other times uh, after that. And again, a phenomenal artist. And I felt just very lucky to to have that experience of touching base with him. That's awesome. I love, I love to hear that. <laughs> it's so cool. Um, yeah, so obviously you're, you're very friendly and, and approachable on set and off set. So that's, that's really great. <laughs> it's good to know. Oh, thanks, well, I try. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, are, there, um, are there any projects now that you're working on that you can talk about? Yeah. Yeah, there's a couple. Um, well, we're excited for the re-release of Complacent. That's going to be fun. Um, right before the lockdown, we had shot all but one day of a really exciting um, thriller mm -hmm. called The Method. Uh, the Method, in, it's another independent project. It's an independent movie directed by Umberto Rosa. Um, Rachel Brooks Smith is, is in it with me and uh, produced by my buddy Jerson Sanjanito. And the method is a really creative, modern way of telling, I was blown away by the script, uh, <laughs> a, a really creative way of telling a Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde story. So the method refers to, you've, you've, and you've, in your career, you've probably come across these people, but method actors where, where you totally immerse into the character and you live the character and you eat the food that the character would eat, and you just, you become the character basically. Right. So it's, it is about, I play an actor who is a notorious method actor. Mm. Uh, super nice, friendly guy, kind of like me, offset. <laughs> but then when he goes into that character, he literally kind of has a psychotic break from his <laughs> personality and he becomes whatever that character is. So it, it's a chance for me to play two completely different characters. And, uh, and it's, it's such a such a mind bender for, for Rachel's character in the movie as well. So really fun called the method. Hopefully will be coming out soon, early next year. I love the, I love the concept. That sounds very, very cool. Thanks. Um, yeah. And, and you can go in so many different directions too, you know, like wh whatever role that your character is up for is playing in the movie, you know, it's very meta. <laughs> it, it, it's very meta. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, the, sort of an unlimited number of, of sequel opportunities if you yeah. ever wanted to turn it into a franchise. Ooh, I could see it now. <laughs> <laughs> I like awesome. It. Um, I like it. Yeah, well, Chris, uh, 
I want to thank you so much for your time today. Uh, the movie is complacent and I believe it is now out on demand. Yes. Yes. All right. Awesome. Well, again, uh, great having you and thank you so much for your time, Chris. Uh, this is great. Randy, this has been great for me. I really appreciate it. Thanks for going to all the bother putting, uh, putting the complacent background up. I mean, you're a class act, man. I oh, love it. Thank you, sir. Uh, cool. Best of luck in your career moving forward. You too. Well, we'll talk. We'll uh, keep in touch. I'll send you the link. And uh, yeah, I want to thank everyone watching at home and on your devices. I'm Randy Unger, and this has been Unger the Radar. We'll see you next time. Take care.